Welcome back to the interview series on the socioeconomic consequences of disruptive technologies by Rethinking Economics and Now. Today, you'll be focusing on one of the most fascinating countries in the world, in my opinion, China. And for that, we'll have four world-class experts related to the AI ecosystem and the policies of China. First with us today is Graham Webster, who is a research scholar and editor of the Digit China Project at Stanford University Cyber Policy Center and a fellow at New America. A joint effort of Stanford and New America, Digit China is a collaborative uh, uh, project to translate, contextualize, and analyze Chinese digital policy documents and discourse. Graham also writes a Trans-Pacific uh, Trans -Pacifica email newsletter. He was also previously a senior fellow and lecturer at Yale Law School, wrote the CNET news blog related to technology and society from Beijing, and worked at the Center for American Progress and taught East Asian politics at New York University's Center for Global Affairs. Graham holds a master degree in Eastern Asian uh, studies from Harvard University and a bachelor degree in journalism from Northwestern University. Secondly with us today is Helen Toner, who is the Director of Strategy at Georgetown Center for Security and, uh, and Emerging Technology, CSAT. She previously worked at the Open Philanthropy Project and worked also as a senior research, analyst, uh, as a senior research analyst uh, sorry, where she advised policymakers and grant makers on AI policy and strategy. Between working at the Open Philanthropy and CSAT, Helen worked in Beijing, studying the Chinese AI ecosystem, and as a research affiliate at Oxford University Center for the Governance of AI. Helen has written for Foreign Affairs and other outlets on national security and implications of AI and machine learning uh, and, uh, for China and the United States as well as testifying before the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission. Helen holds a bachelor, degrees, uh, bachelor in Chemical Engineering and Diploma in Languages from the University of Melbourne. Thirdly, with us today is Jeffrey Ding, who is a PhD candidate in International Relations at the University of Oxford and a pre-doctoral fellow at Stanford Center for the International Security and Cooperation. He is also a research affiliate with the Center for the Governance of AI at the University of Oxford. His current research is centered on how technological change affects the rise and fall of great powers. Through investigating historical cases of industrial revolutions, he is tracing causal mechanisms that connect significant techn techn technical breakthroughs and economic power transitions, with an eye towards the implications of advances of AI for a possible US-China power transition. Mr. Ding has also a Master in International Relations from the University of Oxford where he studied as a Rhodes Schooler and attended the University of Iowa for his undergraduate studies. Lastly with us today is Matt Sheehan, who is a fellow at the Pulse Institute's think tank, Marco Polo, where he leads work on US-China technology issues with specialization in artificial intelligence. His research maps and quantifies the key inputs to AI ecosystems globally. Matt is the author of the book, The Trans-Pacific Experiment, how China and California collaborate and compete for a future. Really, really interesting book, I have to say. From 2010 to 2016, Matt lived and worked in China, working as an analysis on the consultant on topics connecting China and California. In 2018, uh, sorry, I, I forgot it was lived and worked in China, including as the first correspondent for the World Post. And in 2016, he, re he returned to the Bay Area, working as an analyst and as a consultant on topics connecting China and California. In 2018, he was selected as a finalist for Young China Watch of the Year Award. Well, the first question today is for Graham. Could you tell us more about the, what will be most important for students in economics to know about China's AI ecosystem and policies? I think this is a great way then to start off then the conversation. Sure, well, I mean, it's a big question. And first, thanks for having me. And uh, I'm really glad to be here with um, my, my friends and colleagues and really fantastic experts in China and AI. So I, I'm gonna try to be fairly lightweight since we have so much um, kind of detailed expertise in, in the group here. But, um, you know, from the perspective, it's a little odd for me to speak from the perspective of what economic students should know, uh, because I've never formally studied economics, uh, at least beyond just a little bit in college. Um, so the, the first thing that I would say is that um, China's uh, AI related industrial uh, changes and uh, policy initiatives uh, 
have enormous economic uh, implications, but where I would urge people to look is at the power relations that they reshape uh, throughout society in terms of governance, uh, different actors in the economy and you know the, the uh, comparative power of, of private sector versus state-owned sector actors. Uh, and, and this is a, an area of attention uh, from the perspective of the DigiChana project, which I edit. Um, you know, we've published a lot of work translating um, some of the Chinese policy documents and trying to trying to dive into it. Um, and the, the Chinese government is very concerned with uh, who's going to have more power, for instance, in algorithmic decision making or uh, what it means that certain uh, types of uh, processes would be taken into a machine learning model and uh, and you know what does that mean for uh, the autonomy of, of people in society to the extent that that's a concern what does it mean for uh, interfaces with uh, Chinese government uh, security and uh, economic and social governance uh, priorities and you know one thing that's really clear that I'll, I'll just end with this is that um, the Chinese government, has organized large scale uh, cross functional uh, efforts to study, to plan uh, and to kind of understand the implications of the proliferation of uh, AI use and development in society, in the, in the economy. Um, that alongside with uh, a great number of uh, both innovative in, in terms of uh, their actual new technology developments and innovative in terms of application. There are companies that are, uh, you know, moving into machine learning driven services um, at scale uh, in a way that's uh, rare among various countries of the earth. I think it's also rare that the, the government in China among governments has taken such a detailed uh, approach to this. And I think back to the power element, um, that's because there's a, a great deal of consciousness uh, at various points of uh, control and regulation in the Chinese government that uh, greater automation takes uh, decisions that might have been handled by a bureaucracy with all its flaws and puts it sometimes into uh, relatively inscrutable or even you know uh, completely undocumentable systems in some cases. Uh, and also outside of the direct control of government ministries in many cases. So there's there's a, a huge amount of effort to keep power from the perspective of government. Um, and also, you know, that uh, <laughs> you could speak of that from the from the angle of an authoritarian government that, you know, tries to control a great deal of things. But there's also, um, you know, a, a less uh, uh, insidious uh, interpretation, which is just that officials got together and noticed that this was going to have a lot of uh, uh, implications in terms of power uh, relations, and uh, they're concerned about managing those, sometimes in good ways and sometimes in ways that uh, people in favor of democracy and human rights would not like, but I'll stop there for now. And to ask a follow-up on that, can you also tell us a bit more about how the Chinese AI ecosystem relates to that of the United States, perhaps based on text from the DigiChina project? Well, yeah, I mean, I think uh, I, we really cover, our project really covers Chinese policy in specific. Um, and I think um, uh, some of my colleagues would be a better positioned to describe the in detail, uh, you know, kind of relations between US and Chinese uh, AI ecosystems. But it's certainly clear that, um, you know, methods and technologies developed in each country are uh, highly relevant. Uh, for one another. And there's a great deal of movement of people, especially uh, researchers who worked in universities and companies uh, moving back and forth between the two countries. Uh, and, you know, I would expect uh, that to be a little less recently because we've had such a great deal of tension. Um, and all I'll say is that that's a, uh, AI has been an avatar, right? I mean, it's, I, I like to say AI, whatever that means. We've, we've started our discussion without really defining it. Um, you know, what we're really talking about in this era is the uh, a step uh, in AI technologies uh, from an earlier paradigm to one where uh, the combination of some uh, innovations in algorithm, uh, a greater uh, agglomeration of huge data sets, uh, and some innovations in uh, 
computational infrastructure has allowed a step forward using deep learning and other related machine learning technologies. Um, and that has coincided with a period where the US, United States and China are increasingly conscious of their mutual vulnerability due to technology supply chains and their uh, each country's dependency on technologies, both in terms of um, uh, the way the economy works, the way national security or, or just sort of everyday life is, is uh, unfolds. Uh, and so, you know, it started out with this being a very much a joint production of US and Chinese researchers and companies. Uh, and now there's a question of how uh, deeply any sort of decoupling may be able to advance. Um, and some of it won't be and some of it will be because that, what we have on the table right now are things like, you know, researchers aren't able to travel and work in each other's country as, as easily anymore. Uh, the hostility makes it less appealing, even if they're able to. Uh, the United States has been uh, pretty systematically trying to deny key Chinese companies access to crucial semiconductors. And these are the, you know, so that's two of the, uh, uh, the three things that power this new period of, of AI, so to speak. Uh, and the third is data protection. And the Chinese side has been in a leader uh, in developing new data pr protection technologies. Um, I think, you know, leading the world along with Europe in some ways in, in pushing uh, comprehensive uh, data protection. The US doesn't have that, but it does produce a division between the two uh, that at the moment is deepening. And Helen, related to your expertise, could you tell us a bit more about how this relates to political economic relations, especially the political relations, uh, say how they developed since the 1980s in China and with the more market-based policies there, and especially from the perspective of national security? For sure. So it's a, a big um, big topic to try and summarize, but to, to give it a stab um, at putting it briefly, essentially kind of US-China relations over the last you know 40 years or so, um, one short story you can tell is simply about the rise of China. So the incre increasing um, economic power and also military power that China has had over that time. Um, uh, you know, the, usually look at 1978, the year that Deng Xiaoping um, became the, the president of China um, and started really opening up the economy and going from a Mao era, very, very, you know, communist style control economy and gradually turning into much more of a market-based economy. Obviously there's still plenty of state controlled aspects in China today, but it is you know, much more market-based. So one story is simply the Chinese economy has grown very rapidly over those four decades. It's gone from being sort of very technologically backwards in you know, a term China uses to describe itself or used to, um, to now being, you know, uh, if you look at on, um, uh, adjusting for purchasing power, the, the, the GDP levels, uh, China overtook the US, I think in 20, 2017 or so. Um, if you're looking at total nominal GDP, then, then uh, the US is still well ahead, but you know, China has really been catching up. So one story is simply China was this small backward communist country, and now it's you know, economically uh, a power to, to compete with the United States. Um, a more complicated story, I guess, comes out if you look at the ups and downs in the political relations um, and the um, sort of the warmth of the relations between the two countries, I guess. So the 1980s from the United States' perspective was still very much a Cold War um, focused mindset. Uh, so relations with China were often thought of in terms of um, balancing against the Soviet Union. You know, if, if um, the US could kind of bolster China's ability to compete with the Soviets, then that sort of took a little bit of pressure off, you know, the US-Soviet relationship, things like that. Um, 1989 was, was a, a key year here. So that was um, the year that, um, in June was the Tiananmen Square massacre where you had massive student, present, uh, student demonstrations put down very brutally um, by, uh, by the, the Chinese army essentially. And so that was a real key moment in US-China relations because it, um, the US had really been hoping, you know, really been fairly optimistic about the prospects of China opening up economically and opening up politically at the same time. Um, and that Tiananmen Square massacre was a huge blow to that. Um, but then again, through the 90s you, and, and the 2000s as well, you saw sort of some more, some more hope, some more positive relations. Um, 2001, China entered the World Trade, e Trade Organization, um, which was a really big moment for this you know, formerly communist country that was totally shut out of sort of the international system um, to be in that a full member of the World Trade Organization, you know, fully able to, to trade with other countries sort of like in any regular country. Um, and that included you know, hugely increased bilateral trade with the United States in that period. Um, and then I guess the most recent sort of period we've seen starting around, depending who you ask, 
2008, 2010, 2012 um, has been a period of increasing tensions. And I think partly that is just because of the first story I told that, you know, the China has been has grown more and more and is now kind of more of a um, peer level competitor with the United States. Um, but it's partly also certainly due to um, changes in the political environment in China. Um, Xi Jinping came to power in 2012 um, and has definitely sort of clamped down on uh, media on the little bits of internet freedom that kind of existed in the, you know, the, the around 2010 or so, there were still places that you could, could talk more freely online than is possible now. Um, obviously, we have the situation with the um, internment of Uyghurs in Xinjiang, you have Hong Kong, um, you know, massive changes to, to the whole um, way that Hong Kong is governed over the last couple of years. Um, and so that all adds up essentially to a much more tense um, US-China relationship right now. Um, and I think that's a really important, uh, that sort of incorporates and transcends anything relating to emergency, to emerging technologies. Um, and is, is sort of the backdrop for everything, everything US China right now is that, that increased tension over the last, especially, you know, five years or so. And against that backdrop, can you tell us a bit more about the national security implications of such technologies, such as, uh, especially AI and machine learning? Yeah. So, I mean, in general, I think emerging technologies broadly right now, um, one implication um, or one, one lens to view them through is that China is now in a position where it can be for the first time um, potentially leading or potentially playing kind of a, a, a cutting edge world leading role in some of these technologies. Um, so I think especially if you look at um, kind of genetics um, or things like that, you, you, you see China in a position that it has really never been in before. You know, even, even 10 years ago, you would not, most people would not think of China as kind of a, a research superpower. Um, for AI specifically, and I mean, I think Jeff has really thought a ton about you know, these kinds of implications as well. Um, the way that I tend to think about AI, and I think Jeff, maybe we have different favorite metaphors, I forget. Um, I tend to think about AI as being kind of analogous to electricity and as being a general purpose technology. So it's not just, um, it's not just one technology that is relevant for one sector can do one thing, but it really, its implications are spread across the board. So it's, you know, it's all industries, it's, you know, education, healthcare, military, just everything you can think of, AI is going to be um, going to be having an effect there. And so um, I think that makes it, that can make it challenging to summarize, you know, what are the national security implications? Um, so I think they'll have, they will be really, really broad based and they will sort of transform um, over the longer term, the way that society works, the way that, you know, electricity did and, and more recently, you know, ICT um, has in general. Um, one, one paradigm that I kind of like, um, I guess, to contrast with, sometimes, we sometimes think in terms of US-China competition of sort of who is winning or who is ahead at something like AI. Um, I tend to think that it's more useful to think of, or more, I think it's more likely that if we're looking five, 10, 20 years in the future, the way it's gonna look is that both countries are going to be rapidly expanding their use of these technologies. They're going to be becoming more and more embedded in, in more facets of society. And so I think the interesting questions tend to be more questions along the lines of what does, you know, what does X look like if both countries are using AI in, in these ways, as opposed to thinking purely in terms of who is going to have their nose ahead in any given AI technology. So I think mostly we're just gonna see both countries kind of using these technologies in, in relatively similar ways. Um, obviously with big, big differences um, in some cases that are related to political systems. So, you know, uses in, in surveillance or things like that might be very, very different. Um, uh, yeah, but I'll leave it there for now. Big, interesting topic. Thank you. Jeff, how are you seeing this? Uh, what are your definitions of this and how do, what are the impl economic implications? Yeah, I think uh, both Graham and Helen have touched on uh, really good points. I think the main economic implication uh, that comes to mind for me using Helen's analogy of electricity, which is known as the quintessential general purpose technology or GPT, uh, GPTs, they came into, uh, they really came to the forefront in terms of the economics literature. It's known as like one of the most successful memes in kind of economic history, economics over the past couple of years, uh, past couple of decades. And I think one reason why we talk about GPTs is because they were used to explain why, um, why uh, Robert, Robert Solo, a famous economist, he quipped um, we see the computers everywhere except in the productivity statistics, right? We saw this huge revolution in computing technology. Uh, this was around like 1980s, 1990s. Um, and 
computers were going to change the world, but we didn't see that reflected in actual economic figures, um, making the economy more efficient like they were supposed to. And uh, people who studied general purpose technologies, they said it was because GPTs follow this trajectory of they require a really prolonged period of gestation before you get the complementary innovations. So for electricity, you had the dynamo, but you also needed the steam turbine. You also needed large scale electric uh, utilities to come up to make electricity more accessible. Um, for computers, you needed other complementary innovations like uh, transition from like general computers to like microcomputers, personal computers, uh, more access to computing power. Um, you needed skills upgrading, you needed all these other sectors of the economy to structurally change how things happen to ensure you get that productivity boost. It usually comes um, 30, 40 years later after the first introduction of the GPT. So, so that's what I see as, as a, kind of one of the most important economic implications is how it will affect productivity. And that speaks to a lot of things that um, Helen and Graham were talking about in terms of China's rise. Um, the demographic dividend is fading so where are the sources of continued economic growth, which is a key determinant of performance legitimacy for the regime, where are those going to come from? Um, and productivity growth is going to be one of the key drivers of that. And can you also, can you also expand more, a bit more on your research on the rise and fall of great powers and technological change? And perhaps especially in the context of the US-China relationship and possible power transition. Yeah, so... My current research uh, basically steals a bunch of the economic history and economics literature and takes it to and applies it to the rise and fall of great powers. And um, traditionally, when you, when you see these big changes in terms of who leads the world system, um, political and military balances power, they often follow changes in economic balances of power. So Britain in the first industrial revolution uh, becomes the preeminent economy, and that provides the economic resources uh, to the, for them to expand their empire. Um, same for the U.S. Uh, in the late 19th century, it rises to become the preeminent economic power. And when you look at the the great world wars of the past century, uh, a lot of scholars like Paul Kennedy say it was essentially decided by who had the stronger balance of productive power, the, the ability to churn out uh, massive military forces. So using that as the lens, um, I'm, I, I investigate um, how technological changes uh, affect who can be the leading economic power. And I focus on productivity because that's what leads to sustained growth and um, kind of changes in economic power are from like sustained growth differentials. Uh, so my argument is essentially taking the GPT literature and saying that we focus too much on who controls the innovations in like new industries. Um, and we should focus more on who is diffusing and adapting, like Graham was talking about, who is adapting at scale um, uh, innovations in GPTs. And actually, I, I kind of probably stole some of this and borrowed a lot of this from Kai-Fu Lee's book, um, AI Superpowers, where he talks about like um, the, the, the importance of tinkering and uh, tinkering and, and the age of implementation in electricity. Uh, so that's the, the general thrust of my project. Matt, I was wondering, could you give some practical examples now you see this from the Trans-Pacific Experiment? Practical examples of this sort of diffusion of a technology throughout the economy or practical examples of the sort of US-China interplays in emerging technologies? Well, I think what perhaps be interesting is to first look at the opportunities and tensions and then move towards the economics, uh, which you mentioned. Sure, yeah. Um, when thinking about kind of opportunities and tensions in the ways that US and China are relating to each other in AI. Uh, one of my favorite examples is, it's not necessarily in the book, but I've written about it separately, is the example of a paper called ResNet, uh, Deep Residual Learning for Image Recognition, which was a paper, uh, a research paper published in 2015 in computer vision. And it was over the period of 2015 to 2020, it was not just the most cited paper in AI, but it was actually the most cited scientific paper in any field. Um, so really sort of big impactful paper that has been applied to um, pretty much everything that's been done in AI since 2015. Maybe it's a slight exaggeration, but it's had a huge impact on all other areas. And basically what it is, is you know uh, most of modern AI or deep learning as we, you know, kind of talk about it is built on neural networks. 
and oftentimes the sort of the predictive power of the network, how accurate it can be in making judgments and predictions is based on how many layers you can add to a neural network. And so this paper basically came up with a way of stacking more layers on a neural network and, and maintaining accuracy as you went. So it's a kind of, you know, pretty foundational um, contribution to the field. And, you know, the reason why I'm explaining all this background of the paper is because it came out of a very interesting institution and a very interesting sort of group of people. So the paper was published by uh, Microsoft Research Asia, which is based in Beijing, obviously founded by Microsoft back in, I believe, 1998, um, actually by Kai Fu Li. And in the group of researchers on this was a group of uh, four Chinese researchers, none of whom had ever sort of studied outside the country, um, but were all sort of, you know, born, raised, educated in China. So we have this super impactful paper coming out of an American institution that set up shop in China that is filled with Chinese researchers, but whose uh, work kind of goes to like general publication for the entire world to you know, focus on or to the entire world to build off of, and also goes into Microsoft products. You've got this you know, kind of very interesting interplay between the two. And the question that I ask is, I guess the question that a lot of people in, in Washington DC and maybe other you know, capitals where they're concerned about AI, as we're trying to maybe disentangle these ecosystems, we say, you know, who who won from this exchange? Did the U.S. win? Did China win? Did Microsoft win? Did, you know, who, who kind of came out ahead? And I think what's most interesting about ResNet and this kind of tangled network is it's it's really hard to come to any firm judgment on this. You know, the four researchers, they released the paper and it was from Microsoft, but it immediately was kind of picked up by everybody in the same, you know, as shown in the citation data. So it immediately becomes a major contribution to global AI research. Probably doesn't end up helping Microsoft that much because of that immediate diffusion, but you have the, the researchers behind it, all of whom are kind of, you know, elite level AI researchers. They all sort of split off and went in different directions afterwards. One of them came to work at Facebook um, in the Facebook AI research lab. Two of them went to a Chinese facial recognition company called Megvi, and one of them went to found a Chinese sort of autonomous vehicle startup. And so you see this, you see American institutions, Chinese researchers, Chinese startups, and global AI research all coming together. And, you know, I, I lay all this out and then I say, okay, so what do we think about it? <laughs> There's no really clear answer to that. I think, you know, we have to reckon with the fact that these entanglements in some cases, they do help fuel and build out the Chinese surveillance state. You know, we could make a lot of arguments about how well they would have, you know, technology would have gotten there anyway. Um, but having the the two two of the leading authors on the paper go directly to be the chief scientist at a um, facial recognition startup, I think that's pretty clear that feeds into that. But it also drove forward the entire field of AI, which I think a lot of people hope will have major, you know, social, economic. Um, uh, benefits in the years to come. You know, it just ba basically made us more, made AI more powerful and more uh, applicable to more areas, you know, everything from healthcare to factories and all that. So, yeah, I guess when I'm, when I'm thinking through these entanglements between the US and China and emerging technologies, and not just the US and China, Europe and China as well, um, I think it's important to kind of do this maybe sort of careful work of, of really uh, digging into the specifics of the ecosystems, where are the flows of technology, where are the flows of information, where are the flows of people, um, and, you know, make then hopefully like informed judgments about how we want to affect these ecosystems. You know, I think over the last few years, a lot in the U.S. has just been, you know, if there's a tie between U.S. and China, the assumption is, you know, they're stealing from us, so let's just cut it, you know, cut first and then worry about it later. And I think a lot of the interesting work in the years ahead in, you know, uh, Brussels, in DC, elsewhere is going to be a question of, um, yeah, how can we be really smart in understanding the complex ecosystems here and then making kind of targeted interventions to advance goals that, you know, you may have, whether that's human rights or economic sort of diffusion of technology or uh, anything else. Raym, it seems to me that what we're discussing today also closely relates to not only the political, but also the political legal aspects. Could you perhaps expand on that? And how do you see the comments of your colleagues? So um, I think the thing that sticks in my mind most right now is that um, the outlay that we've all uh, kind of brought forward in that first round, is it makes it difficult to think 
of a national advantage or strength in AI as a sensical uh, statement. I think, you know, that that's because AI is one of these, whatever you mean by that type of concepts. Uh, it's also because national advantage is uh, domain specific. I mean, you could be really good at the particular AI that's used for, um, you know, adaptive missile targeting once uh, ordinance is on the way. Um, and you could be, you know, not so good at as a nation or as a national, uh, you know, government affiliated research center in, um, you know, the cutting edge, uh, you know, AI applications to genomics, right? I mean, it's, they're just different things completely. It's, and, and that is the insight of, of, uh, of looking at um, the present era of machine learning advancements as a general purpose technology. And, and you know, one can sort of debate whether, uh, you know, whether it's the electricity of the era or, or it, is it the, you know, the telegraph of the era or the, you know, whatever it is. But the point is that it's a thing that's multifarious and it has different uh, uses by different uh, people. So I, I, when, when you look at the, um, you know, maybe to direct to what's going on in China, I think at this point, it's especially relevant to, um, to notice that when it comes to key, uh, key firms in China that are leaders in deploying AI technologies for services and, and um, for the operation of their goods, um, there's also a great deal of diversity in terms of the political, social, and economic implications. I mean, the, so there's, there's a certain amount of AI stuff uh, in the kind of, uh, you know, the adaptive elements of the way a 5G network is meant to work. And so your, your Huawei's and your ZTE's are, are set up to be able to do edge computing and uh, to, to do some of these types of, uh, uh, you know, machine learning relevant calculations at the edge of the network without sending, you know, so that there's very little lag uh, before uh, a process would be completed. So that's relevant. And then there's, you've got your um, facial recognition startups, which are, uh, you know, merged with a, a thriving uh, surveillance technology uh, 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 industry that is highly deployed in China and also sells to the rest of the world. And there's massive global demand for it, you know, facial recognition empowered uh, um, facial recognition systems. And then, you know, these are two sectors that are kind of under international attack from the United States with the sort of export controls. Um, we'll see how resilient they are. It, there may be some sort of roadblocks in the in some coming years, but I don't think it's going to be a complete, uh, you know, uh, derailment of, of those efforts. Meanwhile, the, the state's relationship with uh, the big consumer um, platform companies is um, extremely tense in a way that's unfolding right now. We don't really know what's going to happen in the end with the, the, the government's uh, kind of contest of uh, well, I, contest isn't right. I think that the government and the companies are finding a new equilibrium um, so, you know, we saw that in the beginning with uh, what happened when <laughs> Jack Ma uh, stepped a little too close to the flame uh, in, in terms of critiquing financial regulation and the, the government halted the uh, IPO of Ant Financial and which has seems to have spread to a greater, um, a broader uh, antitrust, well, antitrust isn't quite right, a broader uh, recalibration of the power differential between the state and the large platform companies using the tool of antitrust, right? Um, but the you know the government doesn't want Alibaba and uh, and Financial or Tencent or ByteDance and all of these other great massive companies. They don't want them to to fall. You know this isn't a uh, you know a, 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 an effort to really undermine them. It's just uh, there's a readjustment of uh, of power relations, and that's and that's I would I, I'm rambling a little bit, so I'm going to stop right after this point. But the the uh, I think that that moment where uh, the Ant Financial IPO uh, was halted really tells you something about where um, the party state in China perceived uh, the accumulating power of the massive tech companies to have crossed a line, um, and that was an AI driven. Um, you know, element. I mean, the, this sort of this financial innovation slash financial technology uh, 
element there. It it barged into areas that the Chinese banks wouldn't go, providing some services that were not available. But it also took power away from the financial regulators, and that was just too much. And it was no longer just uh, Alibaba reorganizing the um, the physical logistics system of the most populous country on earth, which is something that you can say reasonably it's done with in combination of, with a bunch of other companies. Um, you know, as soon as things cross sectors, the typical Chinese politics, uh, political science story, if the party um, perceives threat when a accumulations of power um, spread across different sectors of society. Um, in, in 1989, the example was that it wasn't just the students, it was also the, the workers, and it was also, you know, some Beijing residents and and uh, and the local um, military who didn't want to intervene in Tiananmen Square at first, and it was also multi-regional. Um, and this is quite different from putting down a regular old um, labor protest. So, you know, the, the fact that compute and data and market power uh, accumulate across sectors has is something that the Chinese government has started to crack down on and and, and uh, we don't know what's going to happen next this is this is really unfolding right now I wanted I wanted to slightly push back and maybe like open for debate one of the points that Graham made which I think is like a very live question in discussing China AI issues so I'm curious to kind of go around the horn on it is the question of, I think the way Graham put it is whether thinking of nation state leadership is like a sensical lens for thinking about AI. Can we in any meaningful way talk about whether US or China is leading? And I think we're, it's kind of like the, where we're at on this as like a, you know, a community of researchers or something like that is kind of very much swinging in different directions these days. I think early on, say 2016 or 17, right when China's AI plan comes out, it's we're all speaking in very crude terms. Who's ahead? Who's behind? China, U.S. No, no real like texture or color on all of that. Um, I think as time has gone on, we've done a lot of the kind of, you know, basically, you know, painting that picture with a more finely tipped pencil. Just made up that metaphor, um, you know, of like drawing these networks and saying, OK, you know, it's not just China. It's actually Alibaba and Alibaba is a multinational corporation. And, you know, drawing that kind of. Uh, you know, basically complicating the idea that there's any sort of ahead or behind. And I think now the question as we kind of go forward is do is whether, yeah, we, whether we kind of keep moving in that direction of saying there's not a national leadership component here or not, maybe a, that's not a very meaningful way to think about it, or whether there is some component of that. And I just wanted to, I think I lean more towards maybe what I was hearing in Jeff's commentary but Jeff, tell me if I'm misinterpreting the idea that, yes, like it's going to be very complicated. AI itself is a whole massive umbrella of technologies. There's many ways to apply it. But, you know, which uh, at a large scale, which country ends up applying this technology to sort of uh, upgrading various parts of their like economic productivity uh, engine across society will have a meaningful big picture impact for referring to Jeff's stuff. You know, it was what he was describing about the way, you know, economic productivity led to sort of world power leadership in a more like modern day context. I think, you know, the internet is inherently global and the companies and the people who work on it are inherently global. But I think we would definitely say the fact that the U.S. and U.S. companies sort of were the first movers and established basically global monopolies on big internet platforms was very meaningful for kind of U.S. technological power, for U.S. values, for the fact that so many countries in the world kind of had to adapt to what Silicon Valley wanted in terms of their information ecosystem. So I think that's where I push back on the idea that, we, that the nation state kind of level is, is not meaningful. I think it will be meaningful going forward, even if it's way more complicated. And just like last thing, I want to kind of bounce off what Helen was saying earlier, which I think is a good a good point that maybe kind of swings me back towards Graham a little bit, which is the idea that, you know, it's not trying to see exactly, what do you say, whose nose out is out in front or something like that. It's not this kind of race where you just, you know, you win by a hair's breadth and then you're, you know, the winner. I think the question of, yeah, the impact it will have on society, the impact 
these technologies will have on each of the different societies and how that just takes them off in different directions is probably an even better and more complex way of thinking about, you know, leadership in the same way that like, you know, we could have just said who gets like 4G first, we'll decide like who's the winner. Or we could have said, wow, in America, 4G uh, is going to distribute the internet. It's going to lead to this gig economy that's going to have all kinds of labor issues. And, you know, you could kind of like go into all those effects. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm rambling here and bouncing off each person because I go back and forth on this myself. But I think it's kind of a interesting question is like, yeah, what's our what's our level of analysis or what, what do we think is the meaningful unit here? I think it's a really interesting way to stating all of this. Uh, perhaps first, Helen and Jeff, how are you seeing this? Yeah, I think, I, I mean, I, I, I think Matt's and Graham's perspectives are very, you know, it's very possible to unify them. Or I think they're all coming from a similar place, which is, uh, I think it's important to be asked, you know, if we're asking questions like who is ahead, important to follow that up immediately with why do we care? Um, or, you know, what are, what are we actually trying to achieve here? And so I think if we're asking something like, what are the potential economic benefits from progress in AI and is, is you know, US federal policy well-designed to help the United States reap those, that's one question. If we're asking, is AI going to enable the PLA, the Chinese military to outstrip the US military and uh, you know, change the power dynamic in the Pacific? That's a totally different question. And I think the answers for those two questions would be totally different. They're both questions that I feel like you know, they're both interesting, they both make sense. It's possible to sit down and do analysis on each of those. Um, or, you know, something else like, uh, is Chinese interest in and willingness to use AI for surveillance going to make, uh, make for faster uh, dispersion of surveillance technologies across the world? And if so, is there anything that, you know, US policy can do about it? Also a very interesting question. Um, but I think, you know, for, for the four of us who spend a lot of time in kind of China, US AI spaces, we often just get the question, who's winning or who's gonna win? Um, and that's sort of a very unsatisfying and I would claim not very useful question. Jeff, how are you seeing that? Yeah, I very much agree with Helen. I think she hit the nail on the head. Um, just asking more specific questions. Uh, I think I think a lot of the um, I think the reason why you get a lot of questions about like, uh, what are you racing towards, or or what, or maybe what, why we are all so, um, kind of, why why we're all pushing back on this notion of what is a national advantage in AI is because um, that narrative can be weaponized for a variety of purposes. So, whatever policy some actor wants in the U.S. government or some interest group wants in the U.S. government. Um, you put a little label frame around it, a narrative around it saying we're behind China on AI. So let's do this. Um, so I think the hope is having more nuanced and more systematic um, analysis of questions like the ones that Helen laid out um, is important and sort of checking back against just like the sort of just be this becoming like a magic narrative that can be used to justify whatever policy uh, you want. I think uh, Matt brings up an interesting point in the sense that like um, we are living in a world that's still globalizing. I think there's some there's some trends towards decoupling. Um, I agree, but I think um, Microsoft Research Asia speaks to to the to this idea that you you either try to connect to globalized innovation networks or you you can't succeed as an advanced economy um, in the 21st century. So we're living in a world that's globalized. Um, but I think there's still a way to think about national economic power, uh, even within the globalized world. So Sean Stars has this piece in International Security, uh, International Studies Quarterly, where he looks at where he looks at like this question of like has American economic power declined, and like Helen brought up some of these statistics of like national indicators, um, like GDP um, and national output indicators. But he looks at um, profits to the top multinational companies. Um, so multinational companies, we've talked about them. We've talked about how they're an example, of how things are cross-cutting and the world is complicated, but you can track down multinational companies headquarters and you can track down um, the profits from multinational companies. And his argument in that paper is that yes, the world has globalized, but most of the multinational companies still call the US home. And um, 
American economic power hasn't declined, it has just globalized. And if you just look at the profits um, as an indicator for economic power, uh, US power is still very steady. So, so I do think there's a way in which we can um, marry the two approaches of like, there is, this is a globalized world, um, but people still talk about, think about it in techno-nationalist lens. So we should, we, we can be more rigorous about measuring that. Um, I also think that we aren't, we should probably take seriously um, the counter argument, which is just that um, national kind of like stuff, like stuff that we would, not, we would think of as national technology assets. So like the amount of spending that your country does on R and D in AI, this is like the standard policy proposal for any like AI policy paper in the U S or any world capital. We should also take seriously that that doesn't matter that much anymore. Um, or at least a lot of people argue that it doesn't matter that much anymore. That national R&D spending doesn't actually correlate that well with national economic success, just because of how globalized innovation is. Um, so I think there are there are also arguments for the other side that like, yeah, um, this complication, this globalization actually does undercut a lot of the, the national technological leadership um, standard indicators that we think about and talk about and propose. So, Graham, how are you seeing this? Can we make this a unified story? And I was also very curious. It seems to me that what we're discussing also relates to the, uh, the, the description of the United States and China being in a race to, uh, towards, to some extent, artificial general intelligence. So a human-like artificial intelligence. Or how are you seeing that? Yeah, well, I, I don't think there, we're too far apart here. I, and um, I think that... Uh, you know, part part of my view that something as inchoate and uh, multifarious as the concept of artificial intelligence um, cannot be reasonably uh, thought of as a national advantage is also because I think that nations are not very, um, frankly, well formed, uh, and I'm kind of just ideologically anti-nationalist, and uh, possibly this is the result of being um, inculcated in, in college by. Uh, series of professors in a world systems uh, theory uh, sequence that involved, uh, you know, a historical sociologist named Georgi Derlugian who'd worked with Wallerstein. And, you know, so I just, I, I did get a lot of this kind of piled into my brain um, when I was uh, in college, but I, I actually quite embrace it. And I think when we, when we think about um, U.S. and Chinese uh, concepts of advantage against one another. First of all, it's just highly diverse in both countries what what a given interest group or individual thinks is relevant about the bilateral competition. Um, it, it's, I mean, I just don't find that it's a very well defined thing, frankly. And and I think that we're we're suffering a little bit right now from a period where, um, you know, it it has to be said that the United States is an ideological crisis. We don't we don't have much of a consensus going in this country uh, on what what the country stands for. So I mean, you know, I, I think that it's analytically useful to question whether there exist national interests, but let's just assume that there are national interests as a, as a deep truth. We don't have agreement on what those are among the various interests and in political sectors in this country. So, you know, then to think of, you know, what is the goal of, of some contest with China um, is yet another layer into the into the weeds of the things that we don't agree on. Um, and then, if you want to apply, you know, specific deployments or developments in uh, advanced automation and data driven automation technologies to whether you're going to lead in one of those things or not. I mean, it's just one you've got to just disaggregate it all. Um, and I think we are, you know, as as um, uh, well, frankly, all of us have been, all, all four of us have been trying to do. But Matt's especially been doing this with Macro Polo recently. Is you know just trying to document some of the things and and um and jeff i don't know if you're still working on that but you know you guys have been working together on this and um on on documenting the different areas of you know what would it mean if we thought that this is what what advantage meant so you know that's that's sort of the project right now um i i think that um when it comes to economic advantage you just have to look at very you know to the extent that nationality and, and sort of national economy is is the right lens which you know it does matter national economic policy has has an effect on the networks of things that are centered in these states. Um, China and the United States just have very different challenges. Um, you know, the 
I think it was Jeff who mentioned the de demographic dividend is is fading uh, in China. There's also just hundreds of millions of very poor people in China, very poor in a way that is not experienced by almost anybody in, in the United States. I mean, it's um, and uh, whereas in the United States, there's a the questions about economic advantage are wrapped up in distributional questions of, you know, whether it's uh, essentially capital winning or are uh, people more broadly benefiting um, and where, where it's capital, it's highly globalized capital and where it's people, uh, you know, who, who may or may not be uh, experiencing uh, advantages, uh, that's more localized. Um, so I don't know, <laughs> that's my um, somewhat um, extemporaneous advocacy for uh, ignoring the nation state uh, boundary as an analytical matter um, and taking that um, rejection into your uh, advocacy that is necessarily national because that's where we have governance to governments to advocate with. Um, as for, I mean, I don't, I don't really think that we're anywhere near anyone in the world um, developing uh, general AI at a at a sort of. I'm not super concerned about the stuff that Nick Bostrom is concerned about with the super intelligence takeoff. And I mean, I am concerned. It's just my my view is um, that this is not super um, near term. And also, um, I don't know if this was the intention of for, for those people who haven't you know gone through that. Uh, that book, uh, Nick Bostrom at, at, I think it's, that's at Oxford, right? Um, Jeff, uh, you know, he, his book describes all of these scenarios where super intelligence would take off. And basically uh, I came away from it. I mean, he, he wants everybody to be very, very concerned and there are people working very hard, exactly super intelligence at the Future of Humanity Institute to think about ways to do that. But I came away from the book saying, well, this isn't super likely, especially not anytime soon. And it's pretty well argued that there's nothing we can do about it. So screw it. Let's let's see if we can answer the questions that we have in front of us right now. And we've got plenty of those in terms of um, various types of injustice and the risk of of uh, runaway national competition and arms races that could undermine uh, the very very immediate existential threat of uh, adapting to climate change and mitigating it. Um, and you know that's <laughs> the my my colleagues here will will have noticed that I bring this up every time, but I do think that this is the um, this is the thing that is the primary challenge um, for the United States and China and for other countries to to work through, but especially the U.S. and China because they're they're so um, powerful as governments and uh, as economic uh, organizing principles in in the world economy. Um, you know that has to be the focus. I mean, and and AI can be part of it. AI competition uh, rhetoric that runs away uh, can be part of undermining adaptation and, and human survival. So I, you know, I just think that, you know, we've got to keep our sense of hierarchy of priorities straight and uh, the habitability of the massive cities within a couple meters of sea level uh, is on the table. Uh, and it depends on what we all do in the next couple of decades. So before moving to the closing questions, Matt, this is combined perspectives a bit for you. How are you seeing this? Uh, I'm sorry, you were saying that my perspective is like a combination of these? Oh, no, no. I meant because at the beginning you said that you were disagreeing with Graham. I was wondering oh. whether you're more agreeing now. Or are you seeing that? No. Yeah, no. I mean, I think what we're doing basically is we're kind of whatever, we're all standing at slightly different places around the room. And I think Helen and then Jeff knitted it together very nicely. I, d I disagree on the kind of in, what, what was the right word? In, in unlegibility. I'm reading seeing like a state right now. So I'm all about legible states or whatever. Um, yeah, I, I, I tend to think, I tend to put a little more focus on, you know, if China or the US or any other country is able to take this technology and diffuse it across their industrial base or their social base or you know whatever faster, there's a good chance that that will lead them to be, uh, you know, they, they will probably become an economic powerhouse. It'll give them a very big boost across the economy. I think it, like Jeff mentioned early on, I think it is seen as kind of a salve for China's like long-term uh, economic 
slowdown that we're probably going to witness. So I focus more on that, but I'm very pro complicating the picture. I'm very pro, you know, what Helen was saying in terms of, um, yeah, asking, asking more specific questions and using those as jump off points than rather than one kind of unified horse race between the two sides. Um, but yeah, just a bit of a difference in, in emphasis, but I think that's kind of, I don't know, lately I've been on this kick of thinking about, uh, the way the field of the field or the community of people who think about, um, us China AI has evolved. And I think it's been a really good example of kind of everyone bringing their different piece to the puzzle. And we're slowly kind of constructing a more sophisticated picture of this. And I think, you know, all the perspectives here, plus the perspectives of dozens or hundreds of other people who have been involved in this has been great. And for, you know, students and whatnot, I think this is my little plug for, you know, if you're an economics student or you're interested in economics long term, there's so, so, so much work that needs to be done in taking so many adjacent disciplines and integrating them with our understanding of emerging technology. And it's a much more kind of open field or like the questions are much more open than a lot of traditional economic issues around inflation and, you know, uh, full employment and stuff like that. The When you bring emerging technologies and bring them in conversation with another field, it becomes both wide open, I think, very impactful in the future and kind of a good opportunity for maybe relatively younger people to get involved and make an impact. I think that's a beautiful way to uh, move towards the closing statements. And for the closing statements, we always have the same question in this interview series, and that is, if there's one thing you could say to students in economics related to the topics we discussed today, what would that be? And I would really like to add to that how the students in economics can get involved in these topics. And uh, first, I would like to ask the question to Helen. Sure, yeah, I mean, definitely picking up on what Matt said, I think the one thing I would want you to know is uh, this is a wide open space. I think none of us have been working in this space for more than you know five-ish years max, um, uh, especially if you're talking kind of with an AI focus, um, just because things move quickly and people's attention shifts. Um, so what that means is that there aren't necessarily amazing kind of paradigms and established ways of doing things in this space, but we're figuring them out as we go. Um, so yeah, don't be afraid to get your feet wet, dive in, see what you think. If you read, you know, a book that's, you know, super intelligence is a great example. That's a book from, I think, 2015. I think since then there's a bunch of stuff in there that I read at the time and thought was really interesting. And since then I sort of thought, yeah, I'm not sure I agree with, you know, with that anymore. I think we've got further in terms of how we think about, um, how we think about those issues. So, you know, if you're coming into the space and you're thinking, oh, wow, there's this amazing expert or, oh, wow, this is incredible, you know, book or paper, um, you might be able to write the better version of that or be the smarter version of that expert or be a, you know, a complementary version of a slightly different expert um, sooner than you think uh, would probably be my, my biggest, yeah, biggest tip. I think it's really cool and really encouraging. Jeff, how are you seeing that? What will be for you the one thing you would like to say to students related to this and how can they get involved? Yeah. Um... A lot of ways to get involved, uh, like Matt and Helen mentioned, kind of just optimizing what you like to do, what your strengths are. Uh, if you can read and translate Mandarin, uh, a lot of us are working in that space, uh, can contribute to DigiChina, or I run a newsletter that features weekly translations of uh, Chinese writings on AI scholarship. Uh, I think my biggest tip would probably be for, you know, Helen mentioned like the, the comparative advantage of younger people in the spaces you actually can get up to date on the technical side a little bit faster and kind of you're not establishing these paradigms. Um, and then, but I think the weakness for us is we forget that there's this, all this other literature out there. So I've really benefited from reading economic history and just like reading about these past industrial revolutions. And I would recommend Nathan Rosenberg's work on history of technology and basically just like read everything that he's written um, and that that'll get you started. I think throughout this series is no matter what topic we're speaking on and which expert and which age and such, it's always read interdisciplinary. I think it's so interesting to see. Matt, how are you looking at all this and what would be the one thing you would like to say to students in this context and your tips? Sure. Um, yeah, I'll put in two quick things. You know, big picture, yeah, get involved. It's, it's very open to getting involved. The two sort of specific things are kind of speaking to what Jeff said about getting up to speed on the technical side. I think this is one of the reasons why it remains relatively open to young people is because I think, you know, maybe older people, even me being someone who didn't study technical things in college, 
like, oh, AI, that's very scary and must be really complicated. It's actually really not that complicated. It's very possible to take a few online courses and immediately like level up your understanding of the technology or even your ability to, to do AI at a, at a low level. You can just kind of really make a huge leap with a little bit of in mental investment in that front. So I'd encourage, you know, not being intimidated and going out and trying to learn the technical stuff. And then I think one thing that we have a shortage of um, is people who are kind of documenting on the ground the application of AI or emerging technologies in the broader economy. I think that I would love to get a lot more reporting, either whether it's from China or from other places uh, around the world, about what happens when a factory decides it's going to try to implement uh, computer vision for quality control. There is some reporting on this kind of thing, but I think it's an area where whether you come at it from a journalistic perspective or a business perspective or however you can get involved and watch that process on the ground level, I think we need more people talking about that. So that's my plug. Yeah, I really agree. And I'll, I'll try to do this myself as well. Graeme, what will for you be the closing statement? And especially related to all the uh, for economics and such. Yeah, well, I, you know, as... Uh... As somebody who's been an interdisciplinary, um, you know, knowledge worker pretty much the whole time, I think um, I would recommend anybody uh, in any discipline break out of theirs. Um, and so that means we, we, there's already been several good uh, recommendations here. I definitely think that a, a detour through science and technology studies um, is advisable, especially if you have at whatever campus you're in. Um, you know, some foundational courses, whether it's sometimes it's in communication, sometimes in, it's an SDS or in a history of science department, um, you know, but just getting getting a sense of what uh, these uh, ec these economic and technological revolutions have looked like in the past. Um, I would also make a pitch for uh, because others have mentioned that, you know, developing some some technical fluency, even if not, you know, as a as a full blown, you know, leading innovator. Um, just I'd put in a pitch for learning um, as many languages as you can stomach while you're um, in these cradles of um, education of universities. I think that um, it's, uh, you know, it's just one of the biggest advantages that you can get. Um, and uh, of course, learning Chinese, if you don't already have uh, that uh, is, a, is a good idea. Um, but there's very little in um, in the US, at least, uh, there's very little understanding of how technology uh, operates in uh, various parts of Africa. There's very little understanding of what's going on in India. Um, just basically look around the world and, and uh, if there's a, a language that you can add or especially a, that's a part of a language group that you don't already have bouncing around in your brain. Um, and if you have some time in your course schedule, um, cram it in there um, because that it really just opens um, the ability to even if you are only kind of an amateur in the language, you can, uh, you know, one's BS detector about uh, soaring reasoning, uh, which is very common stuff in um, social sciences. Often there will be soaring reasoning about some country far away and comparing um, the multiple of them. Every every time you you shove in a new language into your brain and, and bounce around with those concepts and those frameworks, um, it helps one uh, be more skeptical. Um, and since we were mentioning uh, more on the on the ground things, I would uh, recommend uh, my friend Xiao Wei Wang's new book, uh, Blockchain Chicken Farm. This is a quick book. Uh, it uh, plows through a bunch of uh, different sort of aspects of the sort of lived reality of uh, technical uh, technological deployment in especially in rural China, um, and it's just fun to read. Um, you know, we've been talking about a lot of sort of high technology, you know, the, the, the contest at the headquarters, so to speak. Um, it's going to be crucial to, for, for all of us uh, to understand what this stuff actually means um, out in the countryside where, um, you know, and the last thing I'll say is this is a big reality check for me. China just re reached about two thirds Internet penetration. So that leaves about one third of about 1.3 billion people who are not even on the freaking internet yet. Um, and maybe that's not a yet, maybe they won't be while they're alive, right? So there's a whole part of the, the lived human experience that is affected by technological 
um, advancements because it affects the way things work around the world, um, but they're not sharing in it and not experiencing it directly. And I think that that part of the story is, is going to be crucial. Related to the initiatory part on, for instance, Africa and Latin America and such, we actually will have panels with uh, experts from the regions, which are interdisciplinary experts. So I hope that viewers interested in that will also check those out. Thank you for your time. I thought it was a very, very interesting panel. <music>